Okay. So, um, before lunch, we, we heard a little bit about activities in low Earth orbit. Uh, in the first lecture, we heard uh, about rockets, how to get to low Earth orbit. My kind of interest here, then, is to look beyond low Earth orbit, uh, how we might sort of travel out, uh, you know, across the solar system uh, and possibly beyond, and in particular, to look at you know, some of the propulsion systems that we might use to do that. There are a couple of problems to, to, to space. One is the distance problem. You know, uh, for those of you who know Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you know, space is big. You may think it's a long way down the road to the chemist, but that's just peanuts to space. Uh, uh, and you can see here, you know, here is the Earth. And note that this is a, is a logarithmic scale. So, so this distance is 10 times this one. This one is really 10 times. So you know, if we were to actually draw this to scale, this would need to kind of go a couple of miles down the road that way. So the problem is that space is big, so it takes a long time to get to places. Uh, and we see this in particular with deep space missions such as you know, Cassini-Huygens, okay, which went to Titan, or Rosetta uh, more recently. Uh, so if we want to travel out across the solar system, it's going to take time to get there. Depends a little bit on the technology we, we have to do that. The other problem is the velocity problem. Now this admittedly slightly strange diagram here, this is a sort of uh, a map of the solar system done in the style, I think, of the New York subway. Okay? But here, what it shows you is, and you probably can't read these numbers here, I'll put them up there. These are the velocities you need. Uh, a couple of times uh, during the talks this morning, we, we heard mention of delta V. This is a parameter that we, that we use in space to describe both the change in velocity that a particular rocket or propulsion system can achieve, but also how much we need to change the velocity of our spacecraft to travel from one orbit or from one place to another. And so you can see we start down here on Earth, it takes a certain amount of velocity to get to low Earth orbit, and these things show you effectively how much velocity you need to get to different places. Um, so here's a zoom, uh, okay, to kind of show you. So for instance, if you if you want to intercept Mars orbit, okay, uh, after you've left low Earth orbit, you need about a kilometer a second. Uh, if you want to get into a low orbit, okay, you need another one and a half kilometers a second. Uh, if you want to actually land on Mars, then you've got to provide about another four kilometers a second in order to be able to land. Or similarly, you know, if you want to go to Jupiter, okay, you know, the first part of the journey, you know, intercepting Jupiter's orbit is not too difficult. Uh, if you actually want to go into orbit uh, around Jupiter, then you're going to need another 17 kilometers a second. And if you, you know, if you want to, quote, land on Jupiter, uh, not quite a kind of reasonable concept for a gas giant, you need even more. So all the time that we are looking about traveling across the solar system, we're looking at developing, you know, changing the velocity of our spacecraft, uh, whatever it is. This uh, is how uh, we have traditionally done it, uh, using, using rockets. Uh, and um, uh, I'm pleased to see uh, that uh, I hope uh, uh, Airbus Space and Defense you know, won't, uh, won't, won't begrudge me the use of their high-tech demonstrator. Um, but it, it provides me with a kind of convenient demonstration of a rocket. Uh, at lunch, I had a falafel salad. That's my energy source. Okay, here I have a piece of mass. I need a little bit of energy, which will come from that. And if I throw that that way, you know, in principle, I get pushed this way. The same thing happened when we, we had that rather good demonstration with the isopropyl alcohol this morning, which I am so going to steal. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you know um, Newton's laws of motion, action and reaction, and, and so forth. So a rocket is basically something where you have mass, you have energy, you use the energy to accelerate the mass, and you get a thrust. And I think this is the only equation that I'm going to put up. But here you see this thing, delta V. So this is delta V here is calculated depending on what the rocket is like. And if you do the orbit mechanics calculations, you can calculate the delta V required for the mission. And then you have to try and bring these things together and work out if you can do the mission with the propulsion technology you have. And the delta V that you can uh, develop depends on two things. One of these here, VE, that's the exhaust velocity. That's the speed that the stuff comes out the back of the rocket, you know, how fast it's traveling. And then the other one is the change in mass. Okay, MI is the initial mass. MBO is the burnout mass. So you've got a certain amount of mass. You throw it out the rocket at a certain speed, and you will get thrust. And, you know... Depending on how fast you can throw it, you will get a, you will get a, a different delta V. 
Um, there is a relationship, and we saw a version of this graph uh, in uh, one of the earlier talks about, about exhaust velocity versus propellant mass. Suppose in this case, it's just an example, we had a, uh, a spacecraft that weighed uh, 10,000 kilograms, and we wanted to change its velocity by 3,000 meters per second. Um, depending on how fast we can throw the mass out the back of the rocket, okay, we need a different amount of mass. So when it's relatively low, you can see you need a very, very large amount of mass. But as the exhaust velocity gets higher, okay, we need less and less mass. So the first thing we try to do as a kind of first approximation is to use systems that have as high an exhaust velocity as possible, because that means we need less mass. And certainly in our current situation where everything we put into space has to be launched off the planet, we want to reduce the mass that we're having to put on the rocket to do the mission, because if we take less propellant, we can take more other useful stuff. So typically when you hear the word rocket, I think you will probably think of chemical rockets. Uh, and here we see a kind of nice diagram showing the kind of hierarchy of them. I'm not going to talk very much about chemical rockets because they were covered kind of in the, in the first lecture this morning. Uh, and, um, but you can see there are three sorts, solid, hybrid, and liquid. So this is a typical solid motor. This is a hybrid one on, on Spaceship One. And this is a, a little uh, liquid motor for satellite control. Uh, Monopropellants, single propellant which decomposes. Bipropellant, the kind of classic thing where you bring two chemicals together. Uh, and, and, uh, and burn, and then cryogenic, where they're low temperature, such as liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, or storable, maybe, where you've got something uh, such as, uh, I don't know, hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide as your, uh, as your propellant and oxidizer. Uh, uh, and then there are some which are called hypergolic, and these are chemicals which are a little unstable, which when you bring them together, they react spontaneously. Uh, they're, uh, they're very good if you want a very reliable uh, propulsion system. And since we were just talking about the, uh, the lunar module from Apollo, the, uh, the return vehicle okay, from the surface of the moon, uh, this is the engine that was used on that, uh, which is a hypergolic propulsion system because they really didn't want any problems with ignition when they were trying to get the people back off the surface of the moon. So they had a system there. And then at the end of the day, uh, Stuart's master plan, and I know it, is, it has been his... Uh, his wish, <laughs> his plan to have this mass balloon flight in this room for, for some years, we will be using cold gas rockets, okay? These are ones which uh, don't have any heat in them at all. It's purely the pressure, okay, uh, in the container. So we will inflate uh, the, these rockets, these balloons, and we will let them go, and our mass cold gas rocket, uh, uh, maximum launch of simultaneous cold gas rockets. Um, I don't know, do we have someone for the Guinness Book of Records? We should... Uh, we should have done that. But I'm not going to talk about that because yeah, mostly I think people know about, uh, know about chemical rockets. They're, they're how we get off the planet, absolutely. They're the only way we currently have to get things into space. We might have some space planes in the future, but at the moment it's all chemical rockets. Uh, they're even, for the most part, how we do move things around in space, but we're starting to, uh, to change that. Uh, and one of the propulsion technologies that is I would say less well known is electric propulsion. So I'm going to spend a little time looking at electric propulsion. It follows the same basic principle. You have your rocket, you have your mass, okay, but this time you have electricity. In a chemical rocket, the energy is, comes from chemical reactions. So you have a bipropellant rocket, you mix two chemicals together, you get heat, okay, um, uh, and you use that to accelerate the exhaust products uh, out through a divergent, convergent nozzle to get thrust. But it's not the only sort of rocket you can have. Here we're going to use electricity okay, to somehow uh, accelerate, uh, accelerate our mass. Uh, there are three main types of electric propulsion. Uh, electrothermal, which uses electricity to generate heat. Okay. Uh, electrostatic, okay, which uses uh, basically electrostatic fields, charged uh, particles. Um, and then lastly, electromagnetic, sometimes called electrodynamic, uh, which operates for the most part, I guess the easiest way to, to see it is like an electric motor. Okay. So you have a current, you have a, you have a magnetic field, you have a conductor. Uh, those of you who've studied physics, I don't know if you can remember, you know, sitting there, you know, Left hand, right hand rule, kind of, you know, 
you know, I remember this in my A-levels, you know, lifting my head at one point, looking down the road and seeing a bunch of my classmates kind of staring at their hands going, now, this is a motor. Do I lose a left-hand rule, the right-hand rule? Yeah. Um, right-hand right -hand rule for dynamos, left-hand for motors, for those people who've forgotten. And each of these has a number of different technologies. And, it, and it's interesting because in some way this technology is new, but in some way it's quite old. We've only recently started to use it si significantly, particularly in the West, but in Russia, for example, they've been using this for uh, station-keeping attitude control of geostationary satellites since the 1970s. So from that point of view, it's not new. In the West, though, we're only just starting to use this particularly uh, on, on satellites in, in Earth orbit. Boeing recently uh, uh, built its first all-electric satellite, so-called, that had no chemical propulsion systems on it at all. So they launched it into space, and then an electric rocket slowly, slowly, slowly moved it out to its final operation orbit, uh, and then it used the electric propulsion to keep it uh, in Earth orbit, uh, to keep it on its correct orbital slot. But we're looking beyond LEO. So why are we interested in this? Well, although these are low thrust propulsion systems, I mean, the way they say to visualize uh, the thrust of a typical electrostatic uh, rocket is you get one sheet of A4 paper and you put it on your hand, okay? And the weight of that paper is the same as the thrust of that, of that rocket. That's how much you get. You can't use them to lift off from a planet. They won't operate in an atmosphere. They have to operate in a, in a, in a vacuum. Uh, but really, they will operate continuously. If you have a solar array, you can generate electricity. And as long as you have propellant, you can accelerate and accelerate uh, and accelerate. So you can reach much higher velocities. Okay, That's the key thing in a more mass efficient way than you could ever do uh, with chemical propulsion. You need a power source, uh, as I've just said, it's electric propulsion. You can't use batteries. We heard about radioisotope thermal generators earlier today. They are ooh, too inefficient uh, and don't generally provide uh, you know, a, enough power. So for the sort of domains that we're looking at, there are only two ways forward. Solar, okay, which is what we, uh, what we all know. We've seen quite a few pictures of, of satellites today uh, with solar arrays. So solar photovoltaic, for the most part, using semiconductors. Uh, or, in the longer term, maybe, uh, maybe nuclear fission. Okay? Uh, so you get two forms of this. You get solar electric propulsion, and you get nuclear electric propulsion. Currently, there are no nuclear electric propelled systems in space. There have been. Back in the 1960s, uh, uh, the US uh, uh, flew, a, flew a mission for a short while with a small reactor uh, and, a, and a small electric thruster. Um, <clears throat> if, you, uh, if you want to go down that route, obviously the first thing you need to do is to develop a nuclear reactor. There have been space-rated nuclear reactors. Uh, the Russians were the people who had most of the expertise there, uh, but at the moment we do not have any actually space-qualified nuclear reactors to fly, even if we wanted to. And of course, you know, there will be a lot of debate about putting nuclear power sources in space. The Russians have done this a lot uh, in the past, for their, uh, particularly for their ocean imaging satellites, which needed big radars uh, and uh, therefore big power sources, uh, and, and so they flew them. And from time to time, Russian satellites did re-enter and um, you know, spill radioactive uh, debris onto the surface of the Earth. Uh, not, not so common nowadays, I'm pleased to say. So here's some examples of, of electrothermal thrusters. These are the simplest ones. Uh, the one on the left, the resistojet, it's probably best thought of as being like a kettle in space. I mean, it is literally, you have electricity, you put it into a heating element, uh, and then you put a liquid next to it, and the liquid gets hot turns into a vapor and, uh, and, and comes out through the nozzle. So very, very flexible thing. You could put a lot of different liquids down here if you happen to have some. They were looking at the, using them for the uh, attitude control of the International Space Station at one point in the early stages of design. They would have used the wastewater from, uh, from you know, uh, hygiene purposes and just used it as a mass for this. Uh, if you want to go up a notch, you can have, a, you can have an arc jet. Okay? This is where uh, you have actually have an electric arc in here, which creates a plasma, which comes out here. This is ammonia, okay, being used as a propellant, which if you know about arc jets, you can spot from the, from the pretty pink color. Um, that's an arc jet at the uh, University of Stuttgart. Um, at the risk of being 
thought, uh, you know, maybe a bit rude, I'm going to talk about gits now. Uh, a git, a gridded iron thruster. Okay, there are lots of different forms of uh, electrostatic propulsion. Okay, and a gridded iron thruster I've chosen because it's the most common, uh, and it's also one that we have some experience with here in the UK, down, uh, down in Farnborough at uh, Kinetic. Okay, we have a history of building, uh, building thrusters of that sort, and also Airbus down at Portsmouth uh, have expertise in that too. The main aspects are you need a, a propellant, you put it into a chamber here and you ionise the propellant, so you have to knock electrons off, off the propellant in some way. The propellant in nowadays is usually xenon. Um, and then you have these grids, okay, so plates with holes in, which are charged, so they attract these particles out this way. And then by controlling the voltage on these grids, okay, you can accelerate this out here. And you can see there it's quoted an exhaust velocity of, of 30 kilometers a second. And that is uh, you know, typically roughly 10 times higher than you would get from, say, a typical chemical propulsion system. So you've got a much higher exhaust velocity, so you get big mass savings. It's not without its drawbacks. Um, you know, obviously, a lot of ions go through the holes, but some of them hit the grid. And so gradually, with time, these grids uh, will, will um, be eroded away. Um, this is a slightly more complicated one because you need a power source for here, a power source for here. You also need an electron gun because as you're throwing out these charged particles, if you just keep throwing them out, your spacecraft will gain the opposite charge and eventually they'll stop moving away and start to be attracted back towards the spacecraft. So for every you know, ion you eject, you have to just eject a, a insert an electron in there to keep the spacecraft neutral. Um, and this has been used uh, in deep space on a number of missions. Uh, one that's current at the moment is Dawn. Okay? This is used as a, a, an American uh, engine, the, uh, the N-Star, 30 centimetres, so it's about this far across to give you some scale here. Uh, here's a slightly fanciful artist's impression of what it looks like when operating. What you can see here is a typical electric propulsion sort of trajectory. Because, because it's low thrust, although it reaches very high velocities, everything changes very slowly. So you see these typical kind of you know, spiral trajectories for, for electric propulsion missions. Um, here's a, here's a so since uh, uh, Saturn's a little bit in the news recently, here's a concept for a future nuclear electric spacecraft. Uh, this might look like the front. Uh, you might think it's going this way because we're used to think of rockets whoosh, like that. Not the case. Actually, these are the thrusters here. It's actually traveling this way. Okay, so this is your array of thrusters. This is your nuclear reactor here. This is your payload. And this is a big shield between you and the nuclear reactor. Okay, <laughs> whatever you have down here. So, uh, you know, future spacecraft may not look like the sort of rockets that we conceive. As, as, long as, the, as long as it's pushing through the center of mass of the whole spacecraft, that should, that should work fine. But this is a view of the future. What a view of the past. 20 years ago, when I was uh, taking up the, the lino that was under the carpet in my house, I found this. An atomic rocket to Mars, Daily Mail, is that 1958. This is Britain's space plan. Okay? And I'm pleased to note that it quotes Les Shepard, you know, a long-term uh, member of the BIS, a founder. It, it, you can see that tabloid journalism is not really terribly clear, even back, in, uh, even back in those days. But basically, what it's sort of describing is a nuclear electric propulsion system, but they seem to have got the wrong idea about how quickly you're going to get to Mars using it. I think they've confused exhaust velocity of the propulsion system with the velocity of the spacecraft and done a calculation go, that means you could get to Mars in this time, not using nuclear electric propulsion. So, but you know, so it's an interesting thing to see, you know, in 1958, uh, even before I was born, Britain was supposedly thinking about atomic rockets to Mars. What went wrong, I asked myself, but... Uh, um, there were various forms of electrodynamic, electromagnetic uh, propulsion systems. Uh, this is just one that I picked up. This is a pulsed inductive thruster. This is another NASA propulsion system. Experimental, been used on the ground, never been fired in space. This is, uh, <clears throat> here's an example. Uh, I think this is a, a concept for uh, a mission called GMO, the uh, Jupiter Icy Moons Orbiter, which required high propulsion so it could fly between the moons of Jupiter. Uh, and so here you can see these pulsed inductive thrusters here 
trouble with these is they work very well and they're very good, but you have to have a nuclear reactor. I keep coming back to this thing. You need power. If you're going to have electric propulsion, you have to have a source of electricity. If you're out at Jupiter, as we heard earlier, the strength of the sunlight is not strong enough, um, even with improvements in uh, solar photovoltaic arrays. So a nuclear power source of some sort is probably the only way to go if you want to use uh, electric rockets. Um, so that's a, that's, a, that's a concept there. Since we're talking about nuclear, let's look at nuclear rocket propulsion because this is another possibility as well which uh, falls into and out of favor from, from time to time. You could have a nuclear power source uh, and use that to, to heat your propellant maybe. Uh, and there's, there's two broad variants here, continuous nuclear propulsion, okay, a nuclear energy source of some sort, heats a propellant, which is then expanded through a nozzle. So it looks a little bit like a conventional rocket that we're used to, has a nozzle at the back. Uh, but you're putting the energy in from a nuclear power source uh, rather than from a chemical reaction. Or you can have a sort of pulsed nuclear propulsion which uses pellets of material, uh, which are you know, then caused to, uh, to react in a nuclear way uh, and provide both the mass uh, and energy for the propulsion. Um, and so here's a, here's a kind of concept for that. Back in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, and even just a bit into the early 70s, uh, the US were working on a, on a project called NERVA, Nuclear Engine Rocket Vehicle Assembly. And here you can see a concept of it. It's basically a nuclear reactor, okay, and a nozzle. Fuel comes in here, gets heated by the nuclear reactor, comes out here. Gives you a nice high exhaust velocity, gives you a nice high thrust, so you, might think, well, that's, you know, that's just what we want. The problem is, because it's nuclear, you also have to have a lot of shielding uh, that you wouldn't have to have otherwise, uh, which uh, you know, renders it not quite so good. Um, you could, in principle, use it for launching from the surface of the Earth. Whether you would ever get permission nowadays to launch uh, nuclear rockets from the surface of the Earth, I doubt. But there are certainly quite a few people in what I would call the sort of interplanetary exploration community who think that this sort of thing, a nuclear thermal rocket, as it's called, uh, is, the, uh, is the only way forward if we want to uh, explore the solar system with humans in reasonable timescales. Um, this is a concept I love, and I would recommend reading this book, Project Orion, by, uh, uh, by um, George Dyson, the son of Freeman Dyson. This was a plan for a giant atomic-powered spacecraft. Basically, it would use bombs, Okay, and I put bombs in inverted commas because I've been told by a nuclear engineer they are not bombs. They are, they are enhanced yield devices for, you know, but they explode, boom, you know. The, the plan is not to blow things up. And you, you drop these out the back and explode them and then you have an enormous shock absorber here uh, and it pushes the rocket forward. But it only works if you have really big rockets. You know, baseline design of 4,000 tons. <laughs> So it's, it was a great kind of mega crazy engineering project. If you read science fiction by Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell, Remote in God's Eye, this is the sort of thing that the humans developed to, uh, to beat the dwarf elephants who were invading us from space by hitting us with asteroids. If you've never read the book, that won't mean anything to you. But... <laughs> <laughs> and you'll see this Orion concept in various science fiction films as well. I think it was in, uh, I think it was in Deep Impact as well. Um, if we could work out how to do continuous fusion, um, we could build something like this. So this is a, basically a nuclear fusion rocket, uh, conceptual design. Uh, but if we had that, then we could travel around the solar system with high, high uh, accelerations uh, relative to what we can do now. And we could get to Mars in a couple of weeks and the outer solar system much more quickly. Uh, the problem is we don't yet know how to do fusion. Uh, as people are occasionally said, fusion is the power source of the future and always will be. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. Some of my friends are fusion physicists. They think that's a cheap crack. And if you believe Lockheed Martin, they're just about to tell us how they can do a kind of pocket-sized fusion reactor. I would be remiss not to mention the BIS Daedalus project. This is a, a pulsed fusion uh, system. Uh, so first of all, you go out to Jupiter. You mine the atmosphere of Jupiter for your... For your uh, uh, helium-3, uh, you, uh, you build this system. It's a two-stage uh, robotic system. Uh, first stage uh, you know, accelerates uh, um, for two years, so quite a long burn time. 
uh, this bit um, comes off and then this bit uh, travels to Barnard Star. The, the idea was that uh, it would provide a, a flyby uh, within a human lifetime. As we'll see, things have moved on a little since then. Uh, also beloved of, uh, of Larry Niven in his science fiction, the Boussard Interstellar Ramjet. The idea here is you have a fusion power system and a big magnetic scoop. And once you've accelerated up to, a, 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 you know, about 0.1 of the speed of light, you can fly through the interstellar medium, scooping in hydrogen and using that as your fuel so you don't have to take it with you. Uh, subsequent analysis has shown that it probably would be susceptible to excessive drag and actually wouldn't work. But it's such a nice idea, I had to put it in there. Of course, if you can make antimatter, uh, and we can, just in very, very, very small amounts, you could conceptually have a kind of Star Trek style matter antimatter reaction. I don't know whether dilithium crystals would be involved. Probably not, since they're fictional. Uh, and then you have the ultimate power source um, as long as you actually have propellant. So you use uh, the, the antimatter to produce your energy, and uh, then you uh, accelerate uh, accordingly. Um, Solar sails are, are a possibility as well. You get free sunlight if you have a very lightweight structure. And uh, here I have a, a solar sail I brought with me. Okay, it's a fair cop, it's a space blanket, but you know, I thought. Uh, so you have a, you imagine, a, you know, a very, very large, very lightweight um, thing like this with the sunlight shining on it, okay? Uh, you can get free energy, free acceleration, again, not very high. I don't know. There we go. Right, so imagine that you know, the sunlight is shining on it and you will gradually, gradually, gradually accelerate to, to higher and higher velocities. Um, if you want to, you could get big lasers and you could shine the lasers on this. Again, Larry Niven, Jerry Pornell, Motion God's Eye for those people who like 1970s science fiction. I wish you so, you know, big laser, 10 to the 7 gigawatts, you know, shine it on the laser beam accelerate along, uh, and this has uh, recently come back to the fore with a breakthrough star shot uh, where they're planning to fly the spacecraft. I actually have a model of the spacecraft here. If you can see that little black square in the middle, okay, that's the spacecraft, okay? Very, very, very small spacecraft, you know, on a, on a solar sail which you shine lasers on uh, and they figure that they can accelerate this in a very short period of time, up to about 0.2% sorry, 0.2 of the speed of light, so that it can fly, do a flyby of the Alpha Centauri system, uh, you know, within about uh, 20 or 30 years. Um, so, uh, you know, we've seen Konstantin Tsiolkovsky a couple of times, uh, both his photograph and he was quoted on a slide, although I don't think he, he was mentioned. I will leave you with this: Humankind will not remain forever confined to the Earth. In pursuit of light and space, it will timidly at first probe the limits of the atmosphere and later extend its control to the entire solar system. Thank you very much, and I will. Would you like your ball back? Well, that's not mine, that's Matthew's. So we'll go with you. That's, that's expensive, expensive Airbus hardware, isn't it? A uh, couple of quick questions for Chris, perhaps. One over there. Yes. Recently, headlined something called Alcubierre Drive, but obviously all I know about it is the name and that it appeared on my Facebook, so yeah. it must be true, like all the things that appear on Facebook. So <laughs> what category was that? Uh, that? That's kind of speculative physics. I, I didn't, I, I've confined myself here to, to those things which we, we know are at least theoretically possible given given physics as we currently understand it. The, the Alcabir drive is a variation on, on how you might warp space uh, in, in order to, uh, in order to ex accelerate. Uh, Sonny White at NASA Johnson has done some research in it. Um, hasn't, as far as I know, actually physically detected one, although there have been some attempts to try, but it's, it's very, very speculative. Um, so. I think we've got a couple in the back row and then we'll have to move so on. How do you arrange? Be able to propel it into interstellar travel. How do you 
Well, I mean, I mean, a number of ways. I mean, people have looked at this. You, you wouldn't uh, actually put the, the, the electric propulsion, for example, on a launch vehicle. You, 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 you have to find a, a, another way, to, a more conventional way to, for the launch vehicle using probably chemical rocket engines. Once you get into space, exactly what the mix of the different sorts of propulsion system are depends on, depends on your mission. I mean, there have been studies done looking at spacecraft with a combination of chemical uh, and also electric propulsion. The, the exact mix depends on the mission that you're, you're, you know, that you're proposing. Uh, obviously, having two different propulsion systems on the same spacecraft is not a thing that you would choose to do in terms of complexity and cost, uh, unless there was a compelling reason to do it. And one more at the back there, and then we'll have to move on. Do I think it will ever be possible? I'll be. I'll, I'll, I don't know how, but I will be. I will be. I will be optimistic and say yes. I mean, you know, if we had a big fusion power plant and uh, and enough fuel, we could accelerate and accelerate and accelerate and, and get up to it. But I mean, yeah, whether that will happen, that's another question. I mentioned um, Arthur C. Clarke's three laws earlier. Uh, one of the other two that I didn't actually mention by name is that. Um, if a scientist says something is possible, uh, he's okay. almost certainly right. A distinguished right. but elderly scientist is, is, <laughs> is, is, is the phrase, I think. Okay. <laughs> if a distinguished but elderly scientist <laughs> says something... You fell into that one, mate. No, no, no. If <laughs> says something is possible, he is almost certainly right. If a distinguished but elderly scientist, scientist says something is impossible, he's almost, almost certainly, certainly wrong. wrong. Yes. <laughs> right. Um, thanks very much again. Okay. <laughs>